Hello, welcome to Talking Europe. Now, Emmanuel Macron faced a backlash from allies when he said last month that he could not rule out sending Western troops to Ukraine. Now, to be sure, the French president has since sought to clarify his words. He has insisted that no French troops are going to be setting foot in Ukraine in the near future. Nonetheless, the genie is out of the bottle. Now, I'm joined today at the French Foreign Ministry by Jean-Noël Barrault, who is France's newly named delegate, minister delegate for Europe, and he reports directly to the foreign minister. And in recent days, he told a French newspaper that, and this is a quote, Vladimir Putin's imperialist fantasy is not limited to Ukraine. I'm going to start with that. Um, help me along, help my viewers along. Even those who don't follow French foreign policy too closely, we remember Emmanuel Macron saying, we must not humiliate Russia. We remember that meeting across that very long table with Vladimir Putin. We remember his repeated phone calls to Putin after the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Now there's a suggestion, a suggestion of Western troops in Ukraine. Am I missing something here? What prompted this about face, not just with Macron, but the entire foreign policy establishment in France? So I think, you know, it's very clear. Uh, at, after the beginning of the aggression war of Russia in Ukraine, there was uh, uh, an attempt, a brave attempt by President Macron to use all diplomatic ways uh, to try to reason Vladimir Putin and prevent him from you know, his projects, which is basically to violate the borders of the neighboring country and you know, more broadly uh, to uh, create a new international uh, order based on brute force rather than on the rule of law. Uh, and on the, the, the respect of uh, uh, national uh, borders. Now, of course, uh, it turns out that uh, two years later, uh, uh, Russia is still uh, being extremely aggressive in uh, Ukraine, that we are seeing, we've been seeing over the past uh, few months, uh, aggressivity towards European countries through cyber attacks, through disinformation, misinformation campaigns. And this suggests that we need, a, in Europe, to uh, display unity and uh, strength uh, so the, and, and send this signal uh, to Vladimir Putin that we will support uh, Ukraine, whatever it takes, and that we will stand alongside the, the Ukrainian uh, resistance. Now, you, you use the word unity. That's a big word. That's a fighting word in Europe right now. The problem is some allies, even supposedly close allies, Germany, they say France is not pulling its weight in Ukraine. It talks the talk. Emmanuel Macron speaks very well. He's eloquent. Your foreign minister is very eloquent. But when it comes at the end of the day, France is not doing enough. How do you respond to that? If you actually look at the, what they're sending to Ukraine, the numbers, the training, they're not pulling their weight. Um, France has been providing, just like many other European countries, massive support to Ukraine. Uh, two uh, weeks ago, uh, President Macron and uh, Volodymyr Zelensky signed a 10-year security uh, uh, agreement that comes with 3 billion euros worth of military support for the year 2024. And this comes after 2.1 billion euros worth of support in 23 and 1.7 billion euros worth of support for uh, 22. And this is only the military support because there has also been uh, a lot of civil and economic support. And France has also been a driving force in building up a European uh, support for, for Ukraine. Uh, last month, in February, there was a, an agreement, a uh, European agreement, over a 50 billion euros package uh, worth of civil and economic support for, uh, for Ukraine. Now, we would like our US friends to do uh, as much and to unlock the bill that is currently uh, stuck in, uh, in the Senate. So there is a unity of view that we need to support Ukraine, that we cannot let uh, Russia win. But then there is complementarity in the way we support Ukraine because we have different technologies, different military uh, uh, technologies, and so everyone needs to do their part. Okay, you were speaking about um, our friends, France's friends. Uh, there are obviously elections, an election coming up in November in the US. 
And clearly, everyone's looking across the Atlantic at Donald Trump. Now, I remember uh, earlier when Donald Trump was in power, Emmanuel Macron made a big point of reaching out to Donald Trump. He said, I'm the president of France. I cannot have the luxury of ignoring the president of the United States. But still, when you consider the prospect of Donald Trump's return, possibly to the White House next November, what's going through your mind? As a foreign policy designer, creator, what are you thinking right now? Are alarm bells ringing? Well. Uh, you know, uh, the U.S. and France have a long-lasting uh, relationship and uh, deep uh, connections, and this will not change. And we will take uh, whichever president the uh, American people will uh, elect. Uh, what's for sure is that as far as foreign policy is concerned and European policy is concerned is that we need to build our strategic autonomy. In fact, even the U.S. are asking us to, uh, to go down that path. But could I, could I stop you there? Because you say we'll take whichever president Americans elect. There's a really stark difference here. If Donald Trump is elected, there is the prospect, prospect, he would pull the United States out of NATO. That is, that is, this is fighting the, words. This is not the feeling uh, we have. You're and not fear, you're not a, a scared of that at all. Of, of, uh, of a ret retract retractation from NATO, no. no. Uh, he's, he has had uh, strong statements saying that uh, the uh, Europeans should now uh, sort of build up their, uh, their military uh, bases, which is what we're currently doing. What we see as Europeans is that we need two uh, entrance policies. One is NATO and the other one is the building up of our own uh, European technological defense basis. And this is the topic that we're discussing, discussing currently at the European level. And there's a new program, 1.5 billion euros. Sounds like a lot of money. Defense experts say it is peanuts, it is nothing. Thierry Breton, uh, one of the officials said, you need 100 billion euros in a year. How do you respond to that? You're talking the talk. You have a great talk. It sounds really good on paper, but it is nowhere near what is actually needed. You know, there is a proposal on the table by the Estonian prime minister that suggests that just like we did during COVID, mm -hmm. we might borrow again jointly as Europeans in order to finance this military effort that we need to, uh, uh, to make uh, right now. So in the next meetings that we'll have at the European level, that our leaders will have at the European level, this proposal will be uh, discussed. It's 100 million uh, euros 100 billion. worth, 100 billion, 100 billion yeah. worth uh, 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 of uh, common borrowing that has been suggested by the Estonian prime minister. Let's see where this takes us. Let's see where it takes us. I spoke about what election. You have even perhaps closer elections coming up. Europe's elections, just three months away. We know the headlines. The far-right parties are poised to make big gains. Disinformation is a clear and present danger in these elections. You're up against it in these elections from a foreign policy perspective. Are you, having, are you forced to go to the right on policies, such as immigration? I don't think so. Um, I don't think that there is a, uh, that, that, you know, there, there is a, a shift of uh, public opinion to the right. I think that... Uh, center or centrist parties like the one I belong to both at the national and European level need to uh, provide our co-citizens with, with the right answers. And since you're mentioning immigration, it is true that five years ago when the, uh, the current mandate of the uh, members of parliament started, Europe was nowhere regarding illegal immigration. Mm. And because we uh, were convinced that such an issue needs to be treated at the European level. We've worked very hard uh, to uh, sort of uh, establish uh, a pact, uh, a plan for uh, immigration policy at the European level. This plan was just adopted by the Parliament and by the Council and will produce its effects in the, in, the, in the coming years. And during the campaign running or leading uh, to the election, we will tell our co-citizens that because we were convinced that stuff can be done and sometimes better be done at the European level, that we've applied this to a concern that is important for, for them, such as immigration, and that we've succeeded in delivering a, a very ambitious plan on this topic. Final question you could probably answer in 45 minutes. We have maybe a minute. Moldova, right? Small, non-EU member, it wants to open accession talks to the EU. It has a small slither sandwiched between itself and Ukraine called Transnistria. 
There are pro-Russian rebels there. They have just asked Russia for protection. We've seen this film before, haven't we, in Ukraine with Donetsk and Luhansk. What can France do? What can Europe do? Do you see this coming? Can you head it off? So we've, uh, we've always uh, supported uh, Moldova, both in, you know, its, uh, uh, in, in its uh, sort of uh, uh, foreign uh, policy with respect uh, to uh, Putin's uh, Russia, uh, but also in its uh, uh, effort to reform in order to be able to become a candidate for the uh, EU. And we are going to continue on both fronts uh, so support uh, Moldova if there were to be uh, uh, a, a mounting aggressivity from the Russian part uh, or increasing uh, uh, aggressivity from the Russian part and both in their reform effort in order to reach the, the, the or to, to move forward in their accession effort. So do you think Moldova, very quickly, is Moldova the next uh, Ukraine. What I think is that uh, uh, Vladimir Putin will not stop in Ukraine. So this is the reason why we need to make him fail. We started with gloom and doom, and I guess we end a little bit with gloom and doom. Uh, Jean Noël Barrault, uh, the Minister Delegate for Europe, uh, you have a tough job in a very tough time. I thank all of you for watching Talking Europe today from the Foreign Ministry. Stay tuned for more. <laughs>